All right. So Cameron, thank you so much for being here. I was joking before we started, like just a couple of white kids talking about kava. It's going to be fun. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm kidding because yeah. I, I used to be married to a Samoan. And so this was very mm. much part of the, you know, Polynesian culture. They're very aware of kava. Any Polynesian listeners are like, yeah, okay. What you guys got? Tell me about the health benefits of kava. Let's go. Um, and we will. But before we do, I was wondering if you could talk about your story, because I think it's very compelling of what led you down this road to yeah. researching kava. Oh, totally. You know, our stories totally make us. I mean, they define us, you know, it's a, I'm not here in spite of my past. I'm here because of my past. Right. You know, so, Mm -hmm. you know, this is a very, very important educational process for me. I, you know, if you would have talked to me at 18 years old and asked me where I would be in my thirties, the last thing I would have said is that I'd be developing products in the health and wellness world, or I would be uh, going down to, you know, 30 islands at once in the middle of the jungle and to, you know, villages to drink muddy water that gives you, you know, medicinal effects. You know, that's, it, <laughs> that would have sound crazy to me. But, you know, basically all this came out of what I always, you know, it's, it's kind of like we use this term sort of in our world. I, you know, I call it pain to purpose. My mentor, Dr. Dan Pompa coined that term kind of, and he used it all the time. But it's, you know, all of, you know, pretty much everything, all the knowledge that I've accumulated, any of the discoveries that I've made or any of my contribution to any of the influencers in this space that I work with, just any of the work that I'm so lucky to be able to get to do today, it all came out of my own pain, right? You know, we right. grow the most through necessity whenever we're, we're back is up against the wall. There's two main ways to grow and, you know, there's, there's, there's motivation and there's desperation and it's difficult to motivate people. Um, it, well, there's also inspiration, of course, right? You know, you can right. gain inspiration from desperation, but mm-hmm. desperation is going to catalyze a lot of growth really fast in people. So, you know, um, I kind of started out as a kid, like, you know, from an early age, I was kind of one of these sickly kids that no one knew was sick, right? It's like kind of a hidden sick, right? I was functional mm-hmm. kind of on the surface. And you never would have been like, oh, well, he's got a lot of problems or anything. Mm-hmm. But um, I did. And I had a lot of problems. I, ha- I had the seeds of disaster in me, as I always mm-hmm. say, right? Meaning mm-hmm. I-, I now know that I had genes of susceptibility, which don't define you and don't create whole disease processes. But right. you know, every disease process or health process is a gene environment interaction. The genes can be the loaded gun. The environment has to pull the trigger, right? This is the why, what's so beautiful about the principle of epigenetics. But we now know after all of the labs that I've done, all the exploration that I've done sort of retrospectively, we know that I definitely had a perfect storm happen to me that led me to becoming massively ill in my early 20s. Uh, You know, from an early age, I had, uh, you know, a lot of different sort of like metabolic things that led to me developing a little bit more of a high strung high impulsive a little bit eccentric personality which usually comes as an adaptation you know kids or people in general develop impulsivities usually as an adaptive response because everything biologically is about survival and adaptation um you know just uh you, you know from an ancestral standpoint it's it's wired into us to survive If you have some sort of damage physically or some sort of an imbalance that leads to an energy deficit in your body, right? Whether you have an emotional trauma that's inhibiting you, that's causing the expression of excess stress hormones and depleting you of energy, Mm -hmm. um, or excess stressors, you get exposed to mold or chemicals, um, you know, in the womb or in utero, like we have so much today, or say, you know, you'll get exposed to toxic medications or possibly over vaccination or any of these things that are in sort of the, the, the discussion, or in the 90s, whenever we started to introduce massive amounts of pesticides like glyphosate into the food supply, if you have the right genes of susceptibility and these things hit you right, it ends up filling up your metaphorical stress bucket. We always say like disease really is representative of a, of a, of a bucket. Everybody has a bucket, a stress bucket. Um, and you know, every stress that you're exposed to throughout the course of your life is like a drop in the bucket, both physical stress, chemical stress, emotional stress. You know, it all fills it up, right? And, you know, once the bucket fills up, you start expressing symptoms of your genetic weakness. Some of us have smaller buckets and bigger buckets than others. So some of us takes longer for us to get sick. And some of us have genetics where we get sick, say, from biological toxins, but we're highly resilient to emotional traumas and then some vice versa. So this is why some people get sick from certain exposures. Some people get sick and PTSD from going to war. And some people come out pretty well intact, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, But eventually these stressors and the amount of stressors that we have in today's world, especially post COVID, um, you know, it eventually gets everybody right. But I was sort of, I guess, in this category of people that I guess you would consider like a canary in the coal mine, right? You know, Mm -hmm. it's like these, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, people that are set up for more of that type of thing. 
Yeah. So anyways, I had a lot of different talks exposures whenever I was a kid. Um, I had, um, you know, a mouthful of amalgam fillings that we now know contain 50% ethyl mercury. I had mold in different homes and, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, it got to a certain point. And I think, honestly, I think that I inherited probably some biological toxins. There are some emotional traumas that, uh, that uh, I experienced, but also things that I believe are passed down from two or three generations back, right? Where you can have certain genes activated, it gets passed down to the next generation. So long story short, really, um, I had a perfect storm of a lot of different stressors that came together. Um, I started to get sort of, you know, metabolically deficient because whenever you start to have all this pressure on your system and your bucket fills up, you, you end up with an energy deficit, right? Because your mitochondria don't have the resources they need to produce energy because you've generated so much inflammation from this reactivity and this, this constant flow of stress hormones through your system. And that's basically where sick people end up is they end up in low energy at the cell level, right? Mm -hmm. So as you know, a person who's experiencing that, you start to try to adapt by unconsciously compensating by stimulating yourself in any way that you can to get some hormones and brain chemistry going because you don't have enough energy to naturally produce them. So you start doing those kind of things. And this is what leads to any kind of addictive behavior, impulsive behavior, drugs, alcohol. You're trying to escape from your pain, but you're also just trying to feel better. Right. Unconsciously, you don't know this right. is happening. So it ends up being a negative feedback loop because I ended up in a lot of toxic compensatory uh, strategies or you know, behaviors right. growing up. You know, you went pretty heavy into drugs for periods of time. But I, I, you know, I always was success driven. I always had a hunger and drive for meaning in my life. And so I would go down these roads and figure it out pretty quick and pivot and, and mm -hmm. step back and try to find a more healthy way to sort of engage and to make myself feel better, but not getting to the root cause or the root core of right. where these things are coming from and healing myself physically, psychologically, emotionally, getting upstream to the cause, as we say, yeah. um, you know, you're sort of just, you know, you're just like shifting addictions. You know, one of the things that I pivoted to, like in my late teens, probably, or actually early teens, was I became um, an endurance athlete, which brought me all the way into my 20s up until the point that I got sick. And um, that was my drug, right? Although it was healthy in some regards, it taught me a lot. It taught me how to overcome adversity and it brought, it brought so much to me. Um, but at the same time, I developed an unhealthy relationship with it. And it was another sort of, you know, huge stressor that helped, you know, right. put me over the edge because I ended up in this state where I was overtraining when I was running at the highest level. I was, I, you know, I ran, um, you know, at the University of Arkansas in college or in, you know, you know, in a, in a uh, professional circuit for a period of time. I was up, you know, you know, for the Olympic trials whenever I ended up getting sick and all this stuff, you know, racing marathons in the summer, running cross country track, all that stuff, triathlons, the whole thing. But anyways, whenever this all came to a head, basically the bottom fell out whenever I was like 22, 23. Um, at the time, gosh, I was running 150, 180 miles a week. Wow. Um, yeah, I was putting a in a lot, a lot of miles. I was just training at a ridiculous level. And um, plus my diet was terrible. I was eating like Taco Bell like four times a day. I mean, this was years ago. So, you know, have mercy on me, I guess. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> you're in your but, early twenties. Uh, that's what you do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, you're invincible, even though <laughs> I, we did anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyways, so the bottom falls out. I don't know what's going on. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm a rel reasonably intelligent guy at the time and I'm resourceful, but I've still been indoctrinated into that model of if you're sick, you know, someone else is going to fix you. Right. Like I couldn't possibly know anything that my family doctor down the street mm. doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't taught anything about how to upkeep this thing, this body vessel that we've all yeah. been given, right? Yeah. I wasn't taught. It's like, how do we actually generate strength? How do we actually generate more energy? How do we actually right. do that? I'm right. just taught like, you know, if you're not sick and dying, then you're well. Right. And <laughs> if you still can't perform, it's a moral failing and you're somehow a loser. Yeah. And that leads to more psychological yeah. sort of issues at that point, especially in training and stuff and the things that mm -hmm. I was, uh, you know, engaged at the time. When the bottom finally fell out, I crashed. I thought maybe I'm just overtraining. I ended up super depressed because I ended up with like two injuries at once, a bad you know, Achilles thing and stuff. I ended up on the couch and I would just go into these depressions, like say like whenever I'd get an injury or something because I was so invested in that at the time. And I remember thinking, okay, well, I'll recover. I'll bounce back. And two, three weeks went by, two months went by, didn't bounce back at all. And I ended up so desperate. I ended up in a psychiatrist's office. I was prescribed a whole plethora of different 
psychotropic drugs, Adderall being the main one, which is obviously an amphetamine-based drug, not distinguished at all from methamphetamine besides the mechanism of delivery. Right. Um, and that was the icing on the cake that just destroyed and wiped out my system. Wow. You know, trying to compensate for an energy deficit in your system by using amphetamines is sort of like putting jet fuel in a car engine that's already running too hot and it's already super depleted, yeah. right? Yeah. Bad idea, right? It's just, it's right. not, it's just not good because the concept of using synthetic drugs, it's like an override button. It's like borrowing from tomorrow to pay for today, right? Mm -hmm. It's like charging credit when there's nothing in the bank. Eventually you end up in debt and there right. is no, you right. know, yeah, you can totally. function better today. You can get that test done today or you can feel better right now, mm -hmm. but at the cost of tomorrow. Yep. And, you know, eventually after two years of being on that stuff, you know, first of all, it just totally changed my whole personality. Like it, it brought all my pre-existing, any kind of minor impulsiveness that I had or anything that I hadn't, you know, you know, overcome at that age, it put it on steroids. And I basically became a meth addict in a couple of months where I ended up doing crazy things, delusional things, like going on buying sprees, charging hundreds of thousands of dollars of credit. Wow. I ended up going and buying a bunch of exotic animals. I had a, yeah, I was in college at the time. I had an apartment. I had an apartment full of monkeys and dogs oh and a God. fish tank full of piranha. It was nuts. Like I never wow. would have done anything like that. It was like totally like something that you'd see right. out of like a oh, yeah. Ace Ventura, Breaking yeah. Bad, like nightmarish <laughs> combination, you know? Right. And so it, it was just, it was totally, totally nuts. I ended up you know, you know, connecting and being around other people, you know, drug addicts, which I had never been connected to ever before. And right. a lot of things happened. I got money stolen from me on top of that. I had, yeah. you know, all this stuff that, you know, that I had charged in loans and everything. And I was going, I had drug addicts sleeping on my floor, like a nightmare. For you were on the same vibration as them. You were on the, you, your vibe attracts your tribe. That's Absolutely. all that's happening. That wow. law of attraction is that collective <laughs> yeah. energy thing. It's like, it's wow. like, you're putting it out, boom, you're mm -hmm. there and you're in that alternate reality with them. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, and wow. when you're in it, you can't see outside of it. But the reason why that's so important even to this story is because I've been down the road of pharmaceutical drugs and I understand the principles on how they work in the body. And there are application for synthetic pharmaceutical drugs in short-term acute traumatic situations. Obviously there's a time and a place for an antibiotic. Obviously there's a mm -hmm. time and a place for general right. anesthesia, right? Whenever you right. have, totally. if, if, you know, if I get hit by a car, I don't want the essential oils and, right. and, uh, <laughs> and right? Right. it's like, I'd love to be taken to the hospital yeah. and, you know, you know, give me the morphine. For sure. There's a time and a place, but long term, when we talk about health maintenance mm -hmm. and actually giving mm -hmm. to ourselves and building health instead of fighting disease or controlling symptoms or managing symptoms, right. um, that's not the way to go. That system that we have, the allopathic system, was built for acute traumas. It was not built for chronic disease, right? So it's doing, it's not broken in the sense it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. That's why we have the advent of functional medicine and of herbalism and ethnopharmacology and all of the, you know, um, you know, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, you know, regenerative medicine. All of this works upstream at rebuilding health and, and you know, removing the interference that's keeping the body from getting well and then supporting the body's innate intelligence and amplifying it sort of from a systems perspective because the body is a complex system that when you try to override it, you know, uh, then, you know, there are consequences for that, right? Right. Try to hack it in the wrong way. So that was what I did with Adderall. I almost ruined my life. I almost died from that through a number of different circumstances. It actually was a, um, an experience on psychedelics, on plant medicine, discovering that, that, that changed and saved my life, right? I had a, a, a psilocybin experience where in five hours, I realized everything that was happening. Like I was in the middle of it and in the middle of the craziness. And I realized what that drug was doing to me, what I had done by giving up my responsibility. It, 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 it you know, sort of allowed me to zoom out and you know, put my whole sort of life on the table. And I could look at it um, you know, separate from my subjective emotional experience and look at all these things on the table like an engineer would look at a schematic objectively, which is what happens in psychedelics because fusing the two hemispheres of the brain, the way the tryptamines affect the system and everything like that. So, you know, obviously that got me fascinated in plant medicine, but then I had to rehabilitate my life because after having that experience, I had a few more and doing, you know, you know, some of these other, you know, DMT based things like ayahuasca and things. Um, I was totally fascinated just by the, by, you know, the natural world, the natural ecology and what that had to offer. It's like, well, if that 
if ingesting a mushroom could do that, what else do you got? Right. You know, it's like, you know, what else is out there? And it just changed. I mean, everything changed. That's whenever I dove down the rabbit hole and uh, started now, you know, psychedelics will only give you perspective. They open doors and they show you potential. And then you're the one that has to bring that, has to integrate that. You have to do the work, the very hard work to break down those structures, to burn off the dead wood, you know, of exactly. around yourself, you know, you know, symbolically to get to the real stuff inside. And so ever since then, I'd sort of been on this quest first to get my physical health back. So I have the energy to offer something. And I've been, um, you know, trying to get into this world ever since, but for years I had to rehabilitate my health because my health was completely destroyed post Adderall. Um, I realized whenever I went off Adderall, uh, that my system completely crashed, like because of the high susceptibility, um, I had pretty significant chemically induced brain damage. And after getting off that stuff, I literally went off at cold Turkey cause I couldn't in, in good conscience keep taking it anymore. And my system crashed to a point where brain fog and fatigue don't even begin to describe it. It was like brain dead. And I felt like a shell of a human being. And I even went and started the odyssey of traveling around to figure out like how I could rehabilitate myself, exhausted the rest of the allopathic model. Of course I went there and went to Mayo, the whole thing. Um, but I had severe cognitive dysfunction. Um, I went actually and got a spec brain scan similar to what the Amen clinics do, um, you know, around the country that, you know, scan that looks at blood flow and activity. You can actually see how your brain functions instead of just like the physical picture of the brain, like with an MRI or CT. Um, and the radiologist said on the report, and this was post Adderall, you know, before I started building my health back, um, that my scan looked indistinguishable from an 80 year old with dementia, um, you know, from what he sees. And it was just, in, which didn't surprise me because I was getting to a point where I couldn't recognize faces sometimes of people in my family. I couldn't go place by myself. I had to stop driving. I had to move back in with my, my family, my parents at the time, this was years ago. So, it, you know, it was a disaster. And aside from that, I had severe depression, severe anxiety because I had no brain chemistry. Like my whole brain metabolism was shot. My endocrine right. system was shot. My gut was destroyed. Wow. It just had this breakdown of everything in my totally. body from the drugs, but plus all the other things I was exposed to during that toxic slew that I had. But I did have perspective, though, from my, my psychedelic experiences, which was all I needed. So I basically used every bit of energy that I had left um, mm -hmm. to just do nothing but scour medical and scientific literature for a number of years after that traveled around everywhere, went engaged in medical tourism, treatments, therapies, modalities, talked to doctors, researchers, scientists, and just scoured the, the globe for any and every answer and systems that I could get myself well, which I didn't at first. I was rapidly deteriorating for a couple of years and was kind of trying shotgun approaches of one therapy here and there and everywhere because it's not like just doing things. Um, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, a house is made of bricks, but a pile of bricks is not a house. Meaning that like all of these individual bricks or tools, whether it be hyperbaric oxygen therapy or, you know, intravenous, you know, nutrients or single foods or supplements, they really have to be used in somewhat of a system to where you can get a rhythmic sort of momentum and they have to be used at the right time for you. And you don't have to get it perfect, but you can gather enough data where you can dial it in for you through self-quantification of testing, lab testing that we have, um, you know, just experimentation, understanding the principles and it took me years to do this. Um, I had all of these bricks, but I didn't know how to build this house. And I was rapidly deteriorating. And I got to the point where I became so autoimmune driven. I became, I was in this extreme category that we call environmental illness or multiple chemical sensitivity. It's basically a severe form of PTSD where I developed all of these crazy reactions because my gut had deteriorated so much on top of the brain fog. Um, I was reacting to everything that I was eating. Um, everything that I was drinking, every supplement that I was taking. So I couldn't even tolerate any of the things that I was finding. Um, and my reactions were so severe, they would bring me into full grandma seizures and sometimes like anaphylactic shock and everything. And wow. so I got to a point where I couldn't eat anything. I, at one point, I went 12 days without food or water. I've gone longer with just out wow. food, but I almost died from dehydration. Yeah. At this time, I got integrated into the functional medicine world. And I met, uh, you know, one of my mentors, Dr. Dan Pompa, who helped me take all these pieces and put it into a system. And the heart of where I started to get improvement again was mm. through detoxification and then regenerative therapies. But first I had to tolerate things. And that was really what brought me to kava because kava, I was on high doses of benzodiazepine drugs, these anti-anxiety class of drugs, Xanax, Klonopin, those kind of drugs. 
um, just to control my seizures at the time because my seizures were becoming lethal and I had to get them down to be able to tolerate eating or drinking and right. stuff. So I was trying to get off these drugs. So what I was looking for was a plant-based alternative to a benzodiazepine. It was like an analog that bound to the same receptors in the nervous system that I could use to, as you know, sort of like an off-ramp from those things that wouldn't give me the toxicity, the, co- the enhanced cognitive decline, um, and you know, the addiction dependency withdrawal that those, that those horrible drugs would give you. Benzos are taken at epidemic levels. They're, they're almost as bad as opiates, the amount of people that die from them um, and just are addicted to them, um, just like alcohol. So, um, you know, I tried medical cannabis and some different things. That didn't really work. I was too sensitive and, you know, too stony, but it, you know, well, plus they didn't even stop my seizures. They didn't really directly address that pathway. The pathway of interest is a pathway in the body called GABA. And GABA, uh, it's, it's the main calming chemical in the body, you know? And, you know, basically it's, um, it's the main breaks of the nervous system and it's what opposes these excitatory, inflammatory sort of neurotransmitters like glutamate, which is very toxic, which happens when your body's in a state of autoimmunity and seizures, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, looking into the literature, if you're looking at these GABAergic compounds, these compounds that affect this, you're going you're gonna to come across kava. But I had tried kava before in the form of what we call kava kava, right? These little capsules that you find in some health food stores. They're not even in a lot of places, but um, a lot of people who have heard of kava have heard, have heard of kava kava. And I had tried that. And as I got into contact with a couple, you know, herbalists and, you know, met a couple of guys in the South Pacific, I was like, well, I've tried kava. And they're like, no, you haven't. Like, you know, I told them what I had tried. It's like, no, that's not real kava at all. And I was like, okay, well then what is, uh, because I had been reading a lot of the anthropological accounts and I had read and understood that kava was like absolutely sacred to the people of the South Pacific, especially in Vanuatu. It's like the uh, foundational, uh, it's a foundational pillar of the framework of their whole, you know, social, you know, sort of yeah. um, framework of their, uh, right. yeah. So it's a, uh, you know, they use it for weddings, funerals, spiritual ceremonies, everything. For them, it's more important and sacred than psilocybin mushrooms because it's more subtle and they can use it consistently. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, okay, I didn't get any of that. When I got these capsules in the US, it felt like chamomile tea. It was, it wasn't, you know, it was, it was like, trying to you know, take down an elephant with a BB gun with what I was, you know, you know, mm-hmm. dealing with, right. It just wasn't mm-hmm. happening. Um, so I got, you know, sent to me some of the dried root in a bag and it was like this kind of like nasty root stuff. And, um, and, you know, they gave me instructions on how to prepare it, but I was willing to do anything. So I wouldn't complain about that. So I put it in a strainer bag and I kneaded into a bowl of, of warm, of lukewarm water for like 30 or 45 minutes it was really messy. Got my strainer bag nasty. Got my kitchen nasty. Got the the kava lactone oil resin, which are the active constituents everywhere. Um, it took about you know forty five minutes to an hour to do this, and then I ended up with a bowl of muddy water, uh, and I drank that muddy water and immediately noticed an effect. But kava has a cumulative effect. It's a reverse tolerance effect because instead of depleting your system, it's actually replenishing it. So instead of like a pharmaceutical where you get the highest results the first time you take it, then tolerance ensues and then it, it, you know, the effects go down from there. Um, well, it's the exact opposite with kava. It's actually, you know, we know now from the scientific literature, there's actually an upregulatory effect. It's, it's actually helping to rehabilitate the parasympathetic nervous system that's been wow. beat down and damaged in people with PTSD, where you have wow. too much of the sympathetic dominance. Hmm. Um, so as I started to take that stuff and prepare that stuff for like one to two months, I started feeling it more and more until it reached about peak therapeutic efficacy at about two months where I was like, I love this stuff. Like I just totally mm-hmm. fell in love with it. I was able to get completely off my benzodiazepines that I'd been on for years in two months, which is unheard of. And how, often did, how often did you say you were doing it in those two months? I was doing it twice a day and I was having the equivalent. Well, you know, they equated in like shells and in, in coconut shells, like two tablespoons of the stuff. Cool. Um, but I was, I was doing it in amounts that were moderate to high and I was doing it pretty much every day, okay. um, you know, for those two months. So wow. I was, I was going pretty hard with it, but mm-hmm. uh, I was able to get off of my, my benzos in two months, wow. which normally takes at least a year and a half taper. And many people can't even get off of it then. But I, after I got off of them, I felt better than I had before I had gone on them, right? So, so the, the, 
the, sorry to cut you off, the increase in the parasympathetic responses, for, I'm, I'm assuming you're saying it is GABAergic. Does it also play on serotonin and dopamine at all? Or what's yes, the yes it does. There? It does. You know, we primarily, it's claim to fame is, is its effect on, on the GABA pathway, uh-huh. but it also affects serotonin and dopamine. It's also a really powerful monoamine oxidase inhibitor, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. Um, which primarily prevents the breakdown of catecholamines like dopamine and things. So it's more dopaminergic than it is serotonergic, right? Okay. Unlike, say, like what's in uh, you know, one of the mixtures in ayahuasca, which is Benestereopsis yeah. coffee, cool. which is a powerful MAOA, right? Which prevents tryptamines, it allows DMT to be taken up in the brain. Right. Um, this is, is, it's a powerful monoamine oxidase inhibitor, but it's a complex medicine. It has a vast array of active constituents that all work synergistically instead of like one molecule, like in a benzo that has a very linear function that the whole system freaks out and thinks that it has to compensate and shut down that system because something is doing something where it just releases and uses up all of your GABA stores. And then the system yeah. shuts it down further because right. it says we've got right. too much. Right. It's not biologically compatible because um, you know, the, the plant is a biological organism that comes from our natural ecology, and we are biological organisms mm-hmm. that come from our natural ecology. We're like the mm-hmm. apple on the tree. We extend it out of this world. We don't reign over it. We're not individual. We're, we're a part of an integrated living mm-hmm. system, right? Sort of like the guy in principle, right? Mm-hmm. And you, you kind of realize that, or you have that feeling mm-hmm. generally whenever you take something like ayahuasca or psilocybin or even right. kava. Kava is a very subtle entheogen that doesn't that you can actually take and maintain your sobriety. It's more of the background psychological thing. And that effect accumulates over time with long-term use. It's very subtle. Wow, if very if psilocybin shouts a message to you, Kava whispers it. Sometimes the best medicine is the one that very subtly does these things because anyone can tolerate that. Not everyone can tolerate psilocybin or DMT. So it's well known in the South Pacific that not only does kava have amazing therapeutic application physiologically, mm-hmm. but it, it helps to develop a person psychologically and helps its medicine for, for you psychologically and emotionally over time because it helps balance the limbic system. It helps connect two parts of the brain very slowly and mm-hmm. allows you to be able to think more introspectively in a more complex mm-hmm. manner, almost like microdosing. Right, right. I compare it to microdosing, but without the legal issues and without the tolerance issues you can get from microdosing. Interesting. Because the microdosing, you know, psilocybin, if you've ever tried to take psilocybin yeah. or LSD or any of those back-to-back, tolerance ensues really quickly. It's a problem. Right. With Kava, it's the exact opposite. Wow. So it's, you know, we have multiple different forms that, that we work with. And, you know, the products that I develop, some like the oil that's very subtle for anyone to tolerate, even kids, some like the drink line that we're working with that is, can stand up to alcohol as far as its potency, but without the drunkenness, addiction, Mm -hmm. you don't become a different person. You become more of who you are. You know, you really can connect with people in a very social way instead of like, you know, whenever you drink alcohol, you kind of become a little bit more primitive. The more you drink past a certain point, right? It's like conversation doesn't get deep after a certain point. It just gets kind of stupid. Um, You know, kava is like, the depth really, really comes out just like if you were in an entheogenic, uh, you know, you know yeah. gathering with people, but you're still sober. It's like, it's, it's like this perfect range. It's like, there's really nothing like it. That's one reason why it's so sacred. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So on the, on the neurotransmitter talk, cause that's, um, if you know, my clients and people know that's, that's definitely an area of interest for me. Are you, if, I feel like you're almost describing like a, an, an adaptogen, a, adaptogenic effect for GABA. Like it's not going to like spill you so far over that you're like, now your body is like, like if people do MDMA, that can be very healing for them. That's mm-hmm. not a plant, but it can be because of that serotonin rush. They get into this very empathetic, mm-hmm. healing, loving space, but they kind of have to pay for it on the back end. Yeah. Because their their body says, "Whoa, don't make so much serotonin." Like apparently, we have way too much, and then you have two days of like being kind of down, right? And so you're saying that doesn't happen with kava. That with it, that that ga- the body is not saying, "Whoa, whoa, 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 too much gaba." Down regulate, down regulate. You're saying it just mm-hmm. increases a healthy gaba level, is what you guys have found, or that's exactly right. And that's what we see yeah. in the scientific literature. That's what the indigenous people they don't describe it in that way in terms of gaba and biochemistry, but they describe it in a way. Yeah. Of, it giving and rehabilitating the system while modulating and balancing it. it sort of, cool. it sort of yeah. comes in and it sort of like, you know, it, it sort of wraps this warm blanket around you and helps to just sort of rehabilitate Beautiful. on every level. But like, you know, with MDMA, 
yes, you know, you can get that, but it's like you're spending your serotonin currency right. in order to get that effect, you know? Yeah, so it's kind of like the Adderall it. thing a little bit yeah. in, in some sort exactly. of way because it is an amphetamine. So it is that, yeah. it does have that effect. Um, although I, I'm a huge fan of MDMA for therapeutic, yes. acute, kind of like the when exactly. you, you broke your leg and you need to go <laughs> in the Targeted hospital and get, get fixed. Those yeah. psychedelics like the powerful tryptamines, whether it be mm-hmm. MDMA, DMT, mm-hmm. psilocybin, LSD, um, you know, mescaline, peyote, any of those. Well, that's actually phenylethylamine, peyote, and uh, mescaline, um, but it's it's a similar effect. But anyways, they all of those are tremendous for very intentional, acute administration. They are not tonic right. herbs. Right. <laughs> right, totally. You know, I, for a lot right. of reasons, right? It's a double-edged sword. This, it's like a hammer. You can build a house with it or you can hit yourself in the face with it. They're very powerful tools. Kava right. has a different application. Kava is like that thing that you could use either in place of if someone just doesn't have the framework where they can handle right. that if they're past a certain age, if that, that would turn right. their world upside down, it's too much. Right. It's a way of like subtly getting those messages yeah. in and allowing people Beautiful. to change their psyche over time. But it also is a tool that can be used kind of like microdosing where you could use kava in between your more powerful psychedelic sessions right. to kind of keep those thoughts going. Because a lot of times people like, you know, for microdosing, you know how you have a powerful psychedelic experience, you're there. And then over a period of time, you never totally lose it, but you kind of get disconnected and then you do it again. You're like, right. oh, we're back. Oh, wow, right. this is what it is again. So, <laughs> yeah. So we've all had that experience. Yeah. Only a certain group of people know exactly what I'm talking and, about with yeah, that. And but, I'm very, thank you for being open. I'm very open about this. And I, yeah. you know, I will yeah. never, ever shame what has been the most powerful healing. I mean, if you guys aren't watching on YouTube, if you are watching on YouTube, you may have noticed me starting to cry when he was talking about his psilocybin um, healing journey because that is what it has been for me and so many others. So I will mm. never, I, like, I'm not going to like take something that has been so profoundly healing in my life and like have shame about it. Sorry. <laughs> not And sorry. these things are things so, to be taken very seriously. Very We're seriously. talking about, you know, you know the yeah. more powerful ones, you know, Kava, that's what's so great about it is you can use it and not have to worry about this. Right. Right. But, right. You, know, you know, these things are done intentionally and they're done right. specifically, you know, under responsible circumstances, right? With these guides. are not, yeah. <laughs> right. You know, if you, if you try to mess around with these things it will it will oh yeah it can they will do what they want with you right you really don't and it it can end up in a bad circumstance or pretty disastrous right that's why yeah that's why i'm a huge fan of rhythmia in costa rica if anybody wanted to do it's a medically licensed facility it's a safe space it's Mm -hmm. legal all of those things so if you're listening to this like what what are they talking about like i would you know if you want to ayahuasca would maybe consider like the whoa like going from zero to a million um (laughs) ayahuasca is a wonderful teacher but it is a pretty intense experience but i appreciate appreciate that Rhythmia has created a medically licensed facility where people can experience such things. So that's my one like very safe resource. I feel like you're in good hands on something like that. But yeah, I definitely, if you are going to have an experience like this, like going the route of very experienced guides, it's the way I would recommend. (laughs) Well, something like, yeah, no, exactly. Yes. And Rhythmia is a fantastic place. Something like Kava is, is something that has been used and is really really famous for being able to give you that sort of like, if you've had those experiences before, you don't have to keep having them all the time. And some nope. people may say, okay, you know, you know, once in my life, or some people may feel yeah, called to go back periodically to really go deep. But Kava is one of those things that you can revisit that headspace and reopen those doors of everything that you've mm-hmm. already released during those experiences, mm-hmm. where you kind of average everyday waking consciousness wants to protect you from that. Right. Because average everyday waking consciousness wants to but it's it's just as much about blocking out excess stimulus as it is about you know right. seeing and sensing things. It's blocking out most of everything. Right, survival. Right. right. Yes, exactly. It's 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 giving you only what you need for immediate survival, which is important. Because if you were to be right. in that state all the time, right. you couldn't do anything because you'd just be in a state of astonishment and confusion right. and, and too much. Right. <laughs> yeah. So you know, kava is one of those ways that you can kind of. It's a lot easier to get back to a place once you've already been there. And hmm. what what long-term psychedelic users uh, or people who have been on these journeys, like say with ayahuasca, notice that whenever they do kava, it allows them in their daily life to sort of reactivate it, re-explore what they've already learned that they've kind of maybe, you know, forgotten Very in an cool. average everyday state or just to just revisit it and keep it up there at the same point And then, you know, be able to really have deep conversations. Some of the best conversations I've ever yeah. had are over yeah. kava because yeah. it's just, it's so smooth. You can do it anywhere. Like we go to, you know, 
you know, you and I, we go around like to these health conferences where we see a lot of people who are like-minded and stuff. And mm-hmm. we, we, you know, we do these things. And whenever we're, I have, you know, Kava at these places, we have some of the best conversations ever. Like, well, shoot, with the people <laughs> the I'm missing out. I should have found you at Harry Adelson's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where's yeah. my Kava, bro? No. And I, yeah. I actually want to ask you about this too, because here's another thing, you know, I mean, in the Polynesian culture, it's very, it's ceremonial. It's beautiful. Right. And they, they mm-hmm. mix the Kava and it's just this whole process. That's very beautiful. And I told you when we were booking this podcast, I was like, oh my gosh, I got my ass handed to me at a Kava oh, yeah. ceremony one time because I was trying to like show off as like the big girl, put my big girl pants on, like, look how much Kava I can handle. And I totally threw up the next day. It was like so much freaking Kava. So even though it, it's not like horrible, if you do Kava traditionally, you know, it is kind of like dirt water. I'll be honest. That's kind of what it tastes like is a, a little bit numbing. Even I felt like a teeny yeah. bit in my oh, mouth. Yeah. But, so how are you, what is your delivery like on, on yes. true Kava? So this is very important because the two main deterrents with Kava as amazing and sacred as it is, and as popular it is, if you give it a chance for long enough, you yeah. know, most people fall in love with it, even despite right. the taste. But the right. main two deterrents are the, are the time spent in preparation and just the taste yeah. and some of the side effects that you can get if you don't drink the right strains. Because just like with cannabis, there's two, over 200 different strains of kava. Some are more daytime, some are more nighttime, right? Some are more heavy in the body, some are more heady and nootropic and, and mm-hmm. activate that creativity, introspective thinking. And some are a good balance of all those things, right? Mm. But some strains are specifically dialed in and have been for thousands of years to express far lower amounts of certain um, plant defense alkaloids and toxins, mm. not necessarily toxins, but just, you know, irritative compounds that are in the more wild versions of the plant that the plant yeah. uses to defend itself from pests. Right. And some strains are closer to those wild ones and they, and they punch harder sometimes, mm. but those, they can wreak havoc on your gut. They're not toxic if you get them in its traditional preparation form, but they can cause you some, gro- they can cause you to throw up if you drink a bunch of it. They can, you know, give you all this roughage and you can feel just kind of crummy the next day because you get mm-hmm. an inflammatory response. But we only dip from a specific class of the most premium cultivars that are only reserved for like the highest sort of ceremonial purposes and things in Vanuatu. Well, I mean, you know, they're reserved for a lot of, you know, really important contexts, but there's a class of kava that's called noble kava. That's a classification term that was given to a class of strains that have to meet a certain chemical composition mm. where they have n- none of these chow cone plant defense compounds in them and they've been bred for us to be very very smooth and virtually have none of those effects whatsoever um and you know these noble kavas are the only kavas that the indigenous people drink daily and regularly and they're the, you know the other ones that are heavier they use for like very special you know occasions they use them acutely but you know noble kavas are the ones that you want to drink like regularly so, you know and they're very smooth you don't feel any mm. of that but also even with the noble kavas, if you prepare it without the right like strainer bag and stuff, or if you if you prepare it, you can still get some of like just the plant parts and the fiber and it can kind of this sludgy stuff that in some people can still cause some stomach stuff if you drink just because you're drinking a lot of liquid, the volume that you're yeah. drinking. If you're drinking right. 10 shells of the stuff to try to yeah. get to a recreational place, uh, a safe recreational place, it's still very pure the effect, but you can get side yeah. effects. So right. what we've done is is we've tried to take the potency of those noble kavas in that brew and then create a product that's in a smaller volume that is palatable that tastes good that's ready to go that's shelf stable that was very difficult to do because what's on the market right now i explained earlier about the kava kava products the reason why they have no potency is because they use just the standard solvent methodology to extract and they're using alcohol and sometimes chemical solvents that kills kava completely kills kava if you extract with solvents, you dissolve a few active constituents and leave the rest. You need that entourage effect. Remember, kava is this living system, and it works together. You know, every constituent works together like the instruments in the musical orchestra, right? Mm-hmm. And some instruments play front and center the melody, like with cannabis, like THC and CBD play front and center. But there's all these supportive constituents with kava, like with cannabis, it's the cannabinoids and flavonoids. With kava, it's this constituent set called um, kava lactones. And you need all of these cobalactones and the enzymes and the active constituents so the whole orchestra can play at the depth and give you the depth of the experience, the half-life, the, bioavail- the bioavailability. And the experience is just night and day. Like those products mm-hmm. that use solvents, it's mm-hmm. not the same thing. It, look, yeah. it tastes like, it's like chamomile tea. So anyways, um, so we you know, developed a series of different, I developed a series of different um, extraction preparation stabilizing methods. Um, using mm-hmm. high pressure at very low temperatures, no grinding, it's type of pressing method, plus a water extraction. Nice. 
where we're able to extract it in the same way and everything is lab tested. So we do a, you know, you know, a chemical covalactone analysis before and after cool. to confirm that the ratios are the exact same. We had to develop wow. some of this stuff and testing as well too for it. Because I've been working with some of the, the, the top scientists in the world on kava, both in the islands and both in Europe for years as well too. Cool. So we developed that. We also test everything for biological and industrial contaminants because that's a problem too. You get kava from Fiji, a lot of times they use a lot of chemical pesticides. Right. Vanuatu, they use none but they use a lot of river water if you don't have your own farms and things, uh, which we do. We can grow, in, grow individual strains and they can have a lot of bacterial growth and mycotoxin gro- uh, mold growth, which means mycotoxins, big problems. It's, it's not good. So mm-hmm. from a contamination right. standpoint, from a strain standpoint, we choose the right strains. We process it in a way where we're capturing just that covalactone complex, the full one, putting it into a shelf stable form. And with the, with the kava shots that we have and the drinks that we're developing, we give you even more of that potency because it's at a higher concentration. We keep the enzymes in there as well, too. So there's just levels and degrees of potency. Um, you know, the, the oil is more for versatility to give you the effects, but you can take it, you know, you know any time at, of the day. But um, then we also make sure that we're getting 100% root material because the above ground aerial parts of kava, right? So this is a kava plant right here. It's got these beautiful heart-shaped leaves, but those leaves actually have really high levels of actually really toxic defense alkaloids in them, right? The roots have these irritative compounds, certain strains, but these things you're not supposed to consume. There are many plants in nature that there are certain parts of them like rhubarb. If you eat a certain part of the plant, it can very you know, seriously harm you. If you eat another part, you can make a great pie. You know, right. If you eat the seeds of an apple, there are trace amounts of cyanide in there. So there, there are many mushrooms that you can eat that'll kill you, others that right. are medicine. Right. So it's very important we get the right parts. Um, a lot of times, most of the kava out there, a lot of it has these snuck in because these still have kava lactones in them and they want to use everything. They want to save money. It's cheaper material. Um, but you can have something that's not potentially safe. And if you extract it with solvents, you concentrate those alkaloids Mm -hmm. and you end up with a situation like happened in Europe in the early 2000s where a pharmaceutical company did that to try to make a drug. They didn't adhere to the traditional methodologies, just like most of the science trolls out there that, (laughs) that, you know, that, that they think that they know more uh, than the indigenous people, which they know how to, you know, do things obviously in the laboratory scientifically, but they did that. They created a product that was toxic by getting you know, toxic parts of the plant. They hurt a collection of people, ended up with liver toxicity, and, it, and mm. then they get, it got highly publicized. And then this whole belief right. about kava and liver toxicity, which is completely false right. if awesome. you actually get kava. Those yeah. products, the kava kava products, are not by definition kava. Kava is the water and pressure extracted drink or substance from the roots of Piper methysticum, Right. If it's not that, it's, it's, you know, those products are no more kava than a synthetic caffeine pill is coffee, right? Right. People right. die from synthetic caffeine pills right. or people die from cocaine, but no one's dying from coca tea, right? In right. Peru, right? Exactly. It's the same thing. Right. Yeah. So, well said. Um, mm-hmm. I want also like, I, I, you know, something that's been popping out to me is like when you shared that cannabis wasn't super effective for you, um, you know, for me too, although I have a deep, deep love for plant medicines, cannabis for me. I personally don't love the way that cannabis makes me feel. And I've tried, oh, so many strains and so many. I I will say though, I did have one one experience where it was a, a guy I knew who worked for some of the top, top, top level out in California of, of, um, cannabis. And he's like, this dab I'm about to give you is like $40, a freaking like little, every little, (laughs) it's like just this one little teeny speck is like, is like 40 bucks. I'm like, okay, thank you so much. And that stuff was, it truly was like a a beautiful plant medicine experience. I was like, well, if it was like this every time. Okay. So I know like you going into, I appreciate you going into the detail about the process because obviously that makes a huge difference on the experience and the results that you have. So thank you for sharing mm. that part. Um, also, I also just wanted to say, like, there's so many things out there that one person may, because of their biochemical makeup and wherever they're at at the moment, may say, you know what, cannabis is where it's at. You've got to like cannabis. This is it. And it, for you, it, the question is, how do you feel? How do you feel? How do you feel? Is it awesome for you? You don't have to pretend. You don't have to pretend that coffee makes you feel awesome. You don't have just to- Just because like, it's cool, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, just how does it actually make you feel? And I love that you went on this quest- um, this journey and wow, the other thing I just have to share is just the beauty 
I, I, I have proclaimed myself. I'm like, mother nature, is this cool? Do you mind if I do this? I'm, I'm calling myself a, a representative of mother nature. That is the only way I know how to put it. I go into mother nature. I ask what's needed. Let me help. I want to help. I've got a voice. I've got hands. Let me help. And so hearing you talk about, you know, I have this picture of you. Like it's, it's seriously heartbreaking. It keeps making me tear up. Like during the interview, like this image of you, like needing help, needing healing so much. I am going to cry. And like being in this place where like the medical system brought you to this place where you've got like freaking monkeys in your apartment and you're hanging out with drug addicts and putting yourself in these situations that are just like taking you so, so they're just like squashing you down. And then you finally get on this road where nature comes in and is able to just heal you and look at you now. I'm like, look, I'm like, look at him now. He's on this podcast. You just did an interview with Dave Asprey. Like you're just all over. You're just in your truth. You're in your highest vibration. And it's just because you allow nature to heal you, you know, and you, but you had to do your work. You're exactly right. Like that, that psilocybin journey was like, here's, here's what's up. Okay. Here's, here's what's not going well. Here's where you got to go. And you did it. You put like foot, like courageous. I know it was great. Courageous step after step after step after step of like, okay, I will do this. I'll go to freaking Vanuatu and like all these islands and I will do whatever I am intuitively guided to do. And look, look what happened. It's so beautiful. And I just, I just have to point that out because you know, I think we're in this pivotal moment in health where we're waking up and realizing, just like you said, it's not this like somebody else knows better than me. It's an intuitively guided process. The answers are inside of us. If we will allow ourselves to be in these situations where we are in touch with our intuition, we're sitting in nature, we're meditating, we're doing these, these quiet, we're getting still and allowing and listening, and then having the courage to put one step in front of the other and bring more nature into our bodies, around our bodies, look what can happen. So anyway, I just have to point that out because I'm just like, it touched me so much just hearing your journey and seeing what you've done. And, and, and like the passion that I'm hearing in your voice as a reflection of it is just beautiful. I want everyone to have that. Like we can all have that. And you're just such a wonderful living example of that. So thank you. (laughs) Yeah. And you hit it, you hit it right on the head. And thank you so much for saying that because this is just, uh, it's been, you know, I couldn't even put into words how profoundly amazing, terrifying, (laughs) intense, insane this whole journey has been. But you know, you know, I realized, you know, throughout this process and I've come to this realization multiple times in my life that the pursuit of happiness is the wrong pursuit in the sense happiness being pleasure. I don't believe happiness is pleasure. I believe happiness is fulfillment. And I believe it comes from pursuing meaning. So the idea of pursuing meaning is a much higher place to aim than pursuing happiness. And I think that meaning comes through the adoption of responsibility and it comes from overcoming very difficult things, Mm -hmm. right? And being able to take on difficult things. And it comes from being able to contribute to be able to grow and to be, you know, you know, to be able to grow and cultivate your the highest expression of yourself and human being on this you and this experience on this planet, but then also to be able to give that back. You know, Tony Robbins says that you know, you know, growing and giving are the two things that actually bring fulfillment and make a person happy. Right. Mm-hmm. So you can be in a state of tremendous pain, but be truly fulfilled at the same time. Mm-hmm. So. This idea of trying to feel good or thinking, I mean, because I, I was in tremendous, insurmountable pain for years and just complete, just utter, just turmoil. And I was in the deepest, darkest place of hopeless desperation, but in the deepest, darkest place, and this is something that's played out, you know, in story and in archetypes and even in pop culture and all kinds of places where it's been hidden. It's as old, this idea is as old as storytelling itself that, you know, you find yourself in the deepest, darkest place, right? You know, right? It's like only necessity can bring and squeeze that out of you, right? So if that's one thing that, if there's one thing that trauma and introspective experiences like psychedelics that help facilitate that have taught me, it's just that, is that, is that, you know, pressure makes diamonds, right? And that there's tremendous meaning to be found in these states of severe suffering, which is why I'm optimistic about the time that we live in right now is because I understand that those who really step forth and do the work, right, you know, and elicit courage. And and courage doesn't mean not being afraid, right? Right. Courage doesn't erase your fear. Courage is when you face your fear, right? You know, and... uh, And you'll do it. Yes, yeah. And and I I believe that in these deepest, darkest states where you're really squeezed and you're in the back corner and you, you have the right circumstances in place, if you just can surrender to that whole process and look internally, turn the mirror on yourself, 
then you'll find that yeah. you and everyone have a profound subset of internal wisdom yeah. that mm-hmm. is inside of you, that's inside of all of us. That we're all just kind of like the apples oh. in the tree. We're the expressions of that. And oh. yes, we have all these layers and we're monkeys walking around kind of right. and we're biological organisms and all this stuff. But at the core, at the highest expression of ourselves is a level of just infinite, profound wisdom. Yep. And that's really what any self-help expert, um, you, know, you, you know, any psychotherapist or, or doctor who's trying to help you or guide you or any teacher is trying to help you dissolve those boundaries because only you can do it. When you ad- adopt the responsibility and you get that perspective, you find that inside of you, and then you step up and you take that responsibility, then you, c- you start to you know, become, you put yourself and you connect with that internal you that it starts to feed back to you that yeah. law of attraction thing that we talked yeah. before, where it's, it creates this sort of synchronicity turbine that I call it, where it's like you start connecting <laughs> with aspects of your environment and they draw to you. And then there's just this acceleration, this expansion, and then, it, and then it's exponential. And it's I sort of like, that. you know, it's, it's like that old saying that's, I mean, it's in, it's in religious texts, obviously, but it's also just a spiritual text that the idea of the like, you know, to those who, um, who have a lot, everything will be given to those who have nothing, yeah. everything will be taken because there is no standing right. still. Right. Right. You know, it's, um, if you, if you leave, if you throw yourself to the wind, you know, it's the Murphy's law thing, you will devolve into chaos. It takes work, responsibility, perspective, a sense of meaning and purpose to actually align yourself with that greater something that will pull you and bring you to your highest self. So that's, you know, you know, just generally, I know we got off in the weeds there a little oh, bit, but I love, uh, <laughs> I love it. No, I, as soon as you started, I was like, Oh, he's got so much like wisdom waiting to come out from experience. He just like, can't get it out fast enough. I know that. I know that feeling. And I, and I know that that yeah. comes from an inside place. That's where it comes from. You don't get that from just reading about stuff. You read about stuff and it hits, it touches a chord of something that you've already touched on from the inside. And you're like, ah, truth. I identify it. So everything's coming from the inside out. And I, I love that you called it a synchronicity turbine. I had to write that down. (laughs) That is exactly what it feels like. I call it the magical carpet ride, right? I'm like, if you're willing to take this, it's, I mean, as cheesy as it sounds, it's like when Aladdin's like, do you trust me? And that is the universe. And, and, and Jasmine said yes. And she got to go on that freaking amazing carpet ride and there's ups and there's downs and it's scary, but it's freaking awesome. It's freaking awesome. What you'll find on the other side of that, whenever you do (laughs) surrender to that, just like in that archetype there and the Aladdin archetype there is that there is a whole nother world. There is a whole new world. World outside <laughs> yeah. of what you thought and it's beautiful right. and it's amazing and it can be infinitely as good as it can be infinitely as bad right there's there's a reason why oftentimes the 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 archetype or the the the, the symbolism of hell in any text is depicted as a bottomless pit because it can be things can always be infinitely worse mm-hmm. but by the same token if you do take that responsibility, if you connect with your existential core, what I believe all humans really are and everything else is just, I mean, that's the light. Light is what's tangible. Darkness is just the absence of light, right? You yeah. know, and so we get disconnected from it and it's really an illusion, right? There's, there's no such thing as darkness. It's just you shine light in the dark and the darkness disappears in the same way. Right. There's really no such thing as disease, how we think about it from my perspective. Mm-hmm. It's the absence of health, right? Mm-hmm. So if we build health, we bring health in, disease tends to disappear, right? Mm-hmm. Um, instead of trying to fight disease all the time. Now, obviously, there are times and places to to do certain things to get it down, but ultimately, you have to bring health in. That's right. why a healthcare system needs to be about building health. Right. And right. so that we have the absence of disease, just like shining a light on the darkness, the darkness disappears, right? Right, right. That's yep. sort of Beautiful. idea Beautiful. extrapolated there. So, gosh, I love this so much. I'm like, I got to find you at a health something and get me some, get both, because I'm Kava and both of us and have a part two with this conversation. <laughs> oh, yeah. My kind of talk. I absolutely love it. Um, So I'm probably, I mean, guys, like what's coming to my mind? I'm like, yeah, yeah. In my head, I'm like, he has definitely had the plants in him. There's intelligence there that comes that I don't know. I haven't been able to access any other way. And so I'm actually really, really excited to try True Kappa because for me, I have experienced it up the wazoo with microdosing. I mean, I have every single approach with all sorts of biohack. It's a little much for me. I find that I am a a little bit less, I think I'm more productive, but not quite. Um, So I'm always like looking for something maybe a little more gentle or honestly I haven't yeah. been doing it at all for a long time. So I'm excited to try True Kava and see and see what my experience is like with that. And I'll share on social if you guys want to follow, I'll share. And on the entheogenic side, you know, the you know the oil I specifically wanted to keep it very subtle because it's really packaged for the mass market. The drink line that we have going up gets you far more into that place that's like oh, really? that can be very intense. Cool. So there's there's a level of degree because 
there are times and places where you do just want the subtle like anxiety yeah. relief and stuff. And there are times where you want to go into a deeper Kava session, yeah, yeah, yeah. like a social Kava session cool. where you're actually having deep conversations in work. So when's that? So, com- yeah. Is that coming out? You said the drink? Yes, it is. We're doing a large, uh, you know, test run, you know, production with this okay. drink here in the next couple months. And it's going to be like, like a carbonated beverage. They're going to taste great. It's going to have cool. all the effects of like the strongest Kava, you know, so awesome. we're really excited about that. So we're trying that. To integrate that into Western culture. So, we're, you know, the, this whole thing with Kava is more like a movement, right? Because yeah, right. it's a commodity that doesn't exist. And I drew, I, you know, I truly believe just to say real quick here that, um, you know, a lot of the collective behavior that, uh, you know, a, a culture emanates from is h- highly contributed to by the psychoactive substances that they tend to uphold because all cultures have them. Currently, you know, we have alcohol and we have caffeine and nicotine and those things. Um, but, you know, we see this all the time. A lot of times the values of cultures are a direct reflection of the altered states they choose to engage in. Wow. And I believe that if we can make kava part of a regular process, I think that it's going to do a lot for us collectively, psychologically, oh. or make a great contribution in a time that we really need perspective, inspiration, and just protection, a buffer from stress, which is you know, Kava is the great protector in nature. So. Wow. I really like that insight, uh, especially being very close with the Polynesian culture for most of my adult life. I, I'm like, yeah, we could use a little bit more of that. I think a lot of people have gone to Hawaii and they're like, well, we could use a little bit more of this culture over here, you know, yeah. so that maybe the plant, <laughs> the effect of that choice of how we tap into each other could affect a little bit more of a loving environment <laughs> over right. here in the, in the rest of the U.S. Um, okay. So you have a coupon code for listeners. Yes. yes? So yes, it is. do they go to truecava.com? Where, where, where do they go to use this? Uh, yes, yes. So you go to gettruecava.com. That's get T-R-U, not T-R-U-E, kava.com. Um, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook at, at T-R-U Kava. Um, and, you know, you can go and use the code inside out, I believe, for 50%, 15% discount. You just, you, you just type that in at checkout, enter it in cool. at checkout, and you'll get 15% off. So. Okay, cool. And we'll put that in the show notes, guys, so you can see that. And then um, also, if you want to learn more, we, my daughter, who is you know a quarter someone, um, she's interested. I'm like, I'm learning about the health benefits of kava today. She's like, oh, let me see. So we were looking. The, you, they have an FAQ section on their site, so you can learn more about the health benefits mm-hmm. of kava there as well. And then, of course, follow them on social so you can keep up with it. But um, yeah, wow. Thank you so much for sharing with us today your journey that is so, so incredible incredibly impacting. I know so many people can relate. There were about like 5 million (laughs) nuggets in there, I think for people to pull out. And thank you for sharing also this incredible journey and sharing Kava a little bit more about that with us. So um, yeah, can't thank you enough. Oh, it's so much fun. Thanks so much for having me. Great conversation.